On this week's show, we're discussing the upcoming federal emission standards with the former director of the Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Transportation and Air Quality, Margot Oge. Coming up next on AutoLine This Week. Underwriting for AutoLine This Week has been provided by Borg Warner. And now, here's your host, John McElroy. Welcome to AutoLine This Week. Today's topic's all going to be about green cars, emissions, fuel economy, and that's because we've got a pristine expert in this area, Margot Oge, who's got more things than I can list to get into here. She's the author of the book, Driving the Future, comes highly recommended. She's the former director of the Office of Transportation at the EPA. She's on uh, the National Academy of Sciences Board uh, for Energy and Environment Systems. She's also on the board of the ICCT, the International Consortium for Clean Transportation. The guys who blew the whistle on diesel cheating at Volkswagen, by the way. She's also on the chair, uh, 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 vice chair of the board of Delta Wing Technology. So, Margo, awesome to have you on the show with us Thank today. Thank you. Wonderful to see you, John. Uh, also joining us today, Joe White from Reuters, Todd Lassa from Automobile. Great to have you guys here as well. Good to be here. Margo, as you know, uh, fuel economy standards are tough. After 2017, they get much tougher than they've been so far. There's this midterm review where people are supposed to get together and say, it, does it still make sense mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. us to push on in this? Bring us up to speed a little bit. When is the midterm review? Who's going to participate? And how are they going to determine what they should do about these standards? Well, first of all, it's wonderful to see you guys and talk cars. We talked cars before we started all this. Um, so let me say a couple of things. First of all, uh, we had a historic agreement with the car industry. Three agencies, the EPA, uh, the Department of Transportation, and the state of California got together with all the car companies. And we had an agreement, I mean, this is pretty historic, uh, that we agree to double the fuel efficiency by 2025 and cut carbon pollution by 50%. Given the fact that these decisions were made in 2012, uh, we felt it was prudent to take another look you know, the standards around 2016 time frame, and I'll come back to that. So what does that mean? What it means is that the standards are in place from 2012 to tw through to 2021. So the so-called midterm review is only for the standards that we're going to affect for the following four years, 22, 23, 24, and 25. So we're reviewing the stringency of the cars and track standards, standards for those four years only. So what the agencies are doing right now is we're speaking, the Department of Transportation, the Environmental Protection Agency, along with California, they are reviewing all the inputs that went into those standards. And the inputs are, what technologies did we assume are gonna be needed for cars and trucks to meet the 2025 standards? But one of the things, that I, I, one of the things, just a couple of things that have happened since in that four or five years since you since you negotiated that that agreement. Number one, oil prices have crashed and gasoline prices have crashed, and so these regulations are pushing hard against a market force. That we, we, you can see it every month. Yeah. The, the the trend toward larger vehicles. The second thing is that you're ha we have a technology revolution underway. I mean, even back then, I don't think the 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 the, the, the amount of sort of active safety and autonomous driving capability. Um, that was that's now clearly on the table was envisioned back then, and I'm wondering how you think you know the government and the car companies ought to incorporate those two yeah. new facts. <clears throat> Excellent questions. So, let me get back to you just in one second to finish. So basically, what the, the the agencies are doing right now, they're looking at the technologies that they assume, you know, what kind of technologies companies are going to use. For example, one of the assumptions were, on an average, companies will reduce weight by 10% by 2025. Is this happening? Um, there is gonna be more turbocharging and downsizing. Is this happening? They assume only 15% uh, of soft hybrid stop start by 2025. What is going on? Then they're gonna look at the cost. You know, this is the assumptions that we made for 2025. Uh, and they're gonna make decisions based on those inputs. Now, for 20. Couple of couple of myths about the 2025. I want to correct those, and then 
which will get back to your answers. 2025, 54.5 is not a standard. It's based on the assumption, it's a target, based on the assumption in 2012, how many trucks are going to be introduced in the marketplace, the share of trucks in 2025 versus cars. And, <coughs> excuse me, the assumption based on statistics, EIA and others, was that by 2025, about 35% will be trucks. Only 35%? Yes. Uh, it's, it's, and, and you're defining trucks, by the way. I'm uh, sorry SUVs, to interrupt. Yeah. As SUVs, including yes, the smaller yes. crossovers. Uh, uh, without, this, yeah, the smaller crossovers. Yeah. It, which in some cases now are getting, get, let's say, a, a, a C-segment uh, crossover yeah, yeah. will get more or less the same mileage as a um, D-segment sedan. Yeah. So, 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 basi so basically, this, the actual standard is based on the definition of a car. Cars have to do more. Smaller cars have to do much more. It's based on footprint. So a Honda Fit will have to do, on a cafe basis in 2025, 31 miles per gallon. I mean, excuse me, 61 miles per 61, gallon yeah. for Honda Fit. Where a GM Silverado in 2025 has to do 33 miles per gallon. So the standards that EPA is evaluating is not a 54.5. It's the individual standards on a footprint basis. Now, one more thing about the oil prices. Uh, the, 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 the determination that was made in 2012 is that the majority of the improvements will happen from improving the internal combustion engine, it has a big room to be improved, Existing technologies, not big, big innovation, lighter weight materials, 10% reduction of weight. And we assume only 1 to 3% in 2025 of the new cars sold in the marketplace must be electric and hybrid. Okay, so we're already there for electric and hybrid. So the assumption, or what I'm hearing is that this 2025 standard is going to require everybody to go into hybrids um, is not accurate. Again, it's based on a footprint. So if a company decides, like uh, Chrysler, for example, that they don't want to invest on more efficient cars, they, they want to keep on producing trucks, they can do that. The standard doesn't force them to change you know, the offering of the various models. Do you think and, and EPA and, and uh, transportation and CARB uh, won't uh, see a problem during this midterm review if uh, so much more full-size trucks are, are with this so, larger so, footprint are, are built and yeah. sold? So, so, so basically, um, if more trucks are sold than what we assumed, you're going to have less carbon savings and fuel savings. So the agencies can come back uh, and say, well, you know, they're not going to say more cars are going to be, more trucks are going to be sold. Based on that, we're going to do something else. I mean, the Clean Air Act is a, it's a technology forcing statute that requires the agencies to do a very thoughtful analysis of the technologies and the cost. So that will not be the reason to come back and re rethink, but the agencies can say, you know, we believe, based on the analysis today, that cars can do even better because we believe some technologies we didn't consider. I'm just making them. Now we should consider. We believe that the penetration of soft hybrids are higher than what we assume. Uh, we believe that you know the, the companies will reduce in a cost-effective way the weight. So you know if they do that, the standards could be stronger. Uh, but they're going to. By, by doing that, they have to also evaluate the cost of having more stringent standards, okay? So should car companies, the car companies have been, I think, laying the groundwork for an argument that they should get credit for things such as automatic emergency braking. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they say we should get credit for um, uh, connected technology yeah. that allows the car to be routed away from traffic congestion and those sorts of things. I mean, this is in the air. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, from your position as a yeah. former government official and, and now in the groups that you represent and, and work, uh, work with on these issues with, do you think that's a valid yeah. idea? So let me say this. 
as, as all of us know, uh, unfortunately, the CAFE um, standards are based on very old testing procedures. Uh, going back to the 70s that really don't allow some of the new technologies to be captured. Can it's you give us an example? Start, stop, right? Yeah, yeah that, exactly, stop, start, or, or the uh, very aerodynamic grill that some of the companies put in the cars. Solar uh, roofing. So what we did for the 2025 standards, we knew some of these technologies. Actually, we knew about 10 of these technologies, you know, soft hybrid, solar, you know, sol solar roofing. Um, and we said, based on our kind of expert opinion, if you use these technologies, companies, you will get X credits. But beyond these technologies, um, you know, you have to give us some data. So if companies, my view is that if companies have data to prove that indeed, on a consistent basis, these technologies for safety or other purposes uh, improve the fuel efficiency and reduce carbon pollution, they should get credits. But it has to be based on, on data. You know, we had uh, some, some German companies suggesting that we give them credits because of you know, how the driver, you know, they're going to prove the driver to drive in a more eco way, and based on that, we need credits. Well, you know, you can, I mean, I know for myself, you can give me whatever you want to give me, but I'm going to drive the way I drive. So, so it has to be uh, technologies that have some data behind, and, and it's in a comprehensive way. And if that's the case, I think EPA and ITSA would allow it. So there is an opportunity for companies to do that today as we're speaking. Margo, what you're saying is very interesting that Automakers do not have to depend on electric cars, plug-in hybrids, or just hybrids alone. But doesn't it disappoint you that they're selling so poorly? I mean, the, the whole green car segment is shrinking at a time of a, a booming car market, certainly in the United States. And as you well know, the United States pretty much buys more green cars than any other market in the world, even with our cheap gas prices. No, I don't, I, not anymore. I think China China's coming better. up very strong well, in electric. You know, let me say this, clearly the gasoline prices, low gasoline prices, have encouraged people. People kind of have a short memory, they don't remember what happened, you know, uh, you know, six, seven years ago. So people have gone back to trucks. But as we all know, you know, gasoline prices are very unpredictable. So, so and cars, you know, well, you know, you say them. people have gone back to yeah, trucks, yeah. but it, you know, Todd pointed out a lot of these are small crossovers. Yeah. They're small front-wheel drive passenger car-based vehicles yeah. that are counted as trucks. Yeah. But that's where the real growth is coming, not necessarily but let me the big pickups. tell you what is a great news. If you look at the electric cars and how fast they're introduced in the marketplace and the penetration significantly higher than hybrids when they were first introduced. Globally, last year there was 70% increase of electric cars globally. Uh, if, so, and the, uh, one of the main reasons is that the battery costs are coming down significantly. So we are having now 70% uh, reduction of battery costs from four or five years ago to $145 per kilowatt hour. And companies like GM basically are suggesting that by 2020, 2022, it's gonna be $100 to $120. At that point, Experts are telling me that electric cars will be in parity, cost parity, so with the internal combustion engine. And the fact that we have the Tesla S3 and the Bolt, 200 miles range in the mid 30s, in my view, uh, electric cars are here to stay, not, not because of the midterm review, mm -hmm. uh, not because of climate change, because that's the way that the industry is going to go because of autonomous cars, of share mobility, and on demand. Electric power drain is, is, is going to be needed. So how much more public policy, public support and public policy, what are the right public policy tools to encourage yeah. that? Um, uh, Tesla, GM, um, some of the, uh, Nissan are probably going to run out of $7,500 federal tax credits around the time that the, you know, about halfway through the first run of Model 3s and probably Bolts as well. Um, so that public policy support is going away for the very companies that are pushing hardest on this technology. Um, do you think revisiting that is an appropriate, is appropriate or, or, or not? I think there are two things we should think about. We continue to um, support 
oil uh, production and oil sales and uh, with all kinds of breaks in, in billions and billions of dollars. And I think as a country, we need to continue supporting advanced technologies, new technologies like the electric powertrain. So to the extent that uh, you know, 2020 comes around and the cost of hybrids, the cost of batteries continue to be significantly higher uh, than what it makes this vehicle in, in parity with an internal combustion engine, I think the tax credit should continue. But the surprise thing is what's going on at the city level where you see the highest sales of electric cars are in areas where they, they have a lot of incentives, be, even beyond you know, uh, giving you know, uh, individuals you know, $2,000 or $3,000 tax credit. They have all, all kinds of incentives from you know, mo uh, allowing more models to come into the state, uh, allowing these <coughs> cars to be on HOV lane, uh, more plugging. And, and there was a recent ICCT study that saw the top 25 cities in the country have 40% more, they have sales that are 40% higher than the general you know, of electric over, vehicles. Of electric vehicles. So cities, along with the federal government, need to continue the incentives that goes beyond just money. Can I play devil's advocate <coughs> on this yeah. one point? Um, because even in California, which is you know probably mm -hmm. the most supportive state for electric cars, you're hearing this argument, and the legislature has had to respond to an argument that electric vehicle subsidies are subsidies for affluent, very affluent people who don't really need the tax break and are, and, and are you know, essentially coming out of the pockets of people who are much less affluent and have to, you know, have to drive their pickup trucks to make a living. And I'm just curious what you it, think about it, that it, argument. The truth of the matter is that up to now, um, the, the people that were able to afford the Teslas are affluent people. But I have a vault, and it's in the mid-30s, and I don't call myself affluent, and I get a tax credit. Uh, so I have benefited, the company has benefited, the environment has benefited. So, and that's the same thing with the Nissan. So not everybody is buying Tesla, which is 100,000. I mean, there are electric cars that are pretty, you know, cost effective that are bought for people in middle class like myself. I, I should jump in and say too, <laughs> okay. California, the state of California has a, uh, established more of a means testing yes. now. Yeah. Just recently. Uh, yeah. Just recently because of that and including providing subsidies for used electric cars for people of lower income. So it, it's at least started at the California level. Yeah. But that's the irony of the, of the Tesla model is that all the people who've bought $100,000 Teslas will have used up their $7,500 tax <laughs> credits. So by the time we get to the affordable one, there'll be no tax credit left. Let me ask you about... I, ho I, hope, the, the, I hope that the government continues to um, support electric powertrain. It's not just for the U.S. I mean, this is a global leadership issue. Do, do you think there's room to, to increase that uh, 200,000 level? Do you think there'd be any kind of, uh, um, is there any impetus, as far as you know, uh, to uh, try to uh, raise that number? Well, I'm not into the lobbying business. <laughs> so there are other people that are doing that. Um, but again, I want to go back, you know, and, and disassociate this discussion from the midterm review. When you look globally what is going on across the planet, we're going towards electric powertrain. When India says that by 2030, all cars, new cars, will be electric, China sold 300,000 cars. Uh, they're going to double it this year to 600,000 cars. This is, w w this is where we're going. So this country cannot afford not to continue leading when it comes to electric powertrain. And, and, and I, for one, I'm extraordinary proud of what is going on, John. I mean, Ford is putting over $4 billion on electric powertrain. GM is introducing Bolt. I mean, it's just pretty amazing what's Listen, going I, on I, in this I country. love driving yeah. electric cars. I yeah. think there's a lot to yeah. them. I'm not even, yeah. not even talking about the environmental yeah. benefit of them. I'm talking as an enthusiast yeah. driving it. I love them. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we might, some people are saying 2023 could be the tipping point and they really take off. And, and so you're right. Yeah. Automakers, especially in the in North American market, have got to be prepared. Having said that, all the best technology is coming out of Korea anyway. The Chevrolet Bolt, I don't care what Ford's doing, everyone's <laughs> buying their cells out of there. The advanced electronics are coming out of Korea. I hear what you're saying of the U.S. needs to maintain leadership. Sounds to me like we've already lost it. I know about that. I think GM just tripled their battery plan here in the U.S., in Michigan, actually. Uh, they 
Well, that's Publish assembling all the I components they bring yeah, in from yeah, Korea. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, I, I guess Edwin, Elon Edwin, Musk would point to his uh, his uh, the gigafactory. Giga the gigafactory. Uh, There's no question, and and, yeah. and and God bless them. They they've come up with a technology still nobody else in the world is using. That you know the the little yeah, so-called yeah. laptop batteries, which of course they're not laptop batteries. They're much better than that. But I hear this argument, but I, I'm not convinced at all that the United States is going to maintain leadership in this technology. When I look at the cells, which are the, the real core technology to making electric cars work, are all coming out of Korea, with the exception of Tesla. But, but again, you know, um, when you look, uh, look at the catalyst, when the catalyst was first introduced in the marketplace in the US, it didn't come from the US. I mean, you know, this catalytic, you know, the chemistry uh, came from mostly from, from Asian countries. So um, my hope is that the U.S. will do more than just assembling, and, and I believe we will. Uh, but again, you know, you have to bring the car at a cost level that becomes common across everybody, not just the Tesla, the people that can buy Tesla. And the range issue is a big issue. You know, to, having 200 miles of a car that's going to cost that's a, in the mid 30s. Do you think that is a key? It's kind of a game changer. 200 miles. Yeah, I think so. Because it seems like right now the customer is yeah. the consumer is not in the game on this. I mean, you know, it's your the perception. You're, you know, yeah. I mean, I have, you know, I, I hardly go to a gas station to fill my vault. My trips are short, so I'm within 30 miles on electric trains, uh, but. People that I talk to, and I don't have any empirical data to share with you, they basically say, listen, we don't want to have an electric car because they feel nervous about the whole issue of reins. Uh, and I think that will take, we like it or not, that's the perception that people have. Well, not and, the and ones that own electric cars, but the ones that you know, have not entered the market. Range for them is very important. And their commuter car is really right, and, and, and therefore even a thirty or $35,000 electric car is an expensive commuter car. So it still it's comes true. down to cost, doesn't it? It's it? true, but it's not, in the, it, it's not you know, $100,000 um, buying a Tesla. Sure, it's the middle of the it's market. The, the average car the today is $34,000. Right. Right. So they're, they're and, right and smack the in the middle. And the other thing you have to think about, you don't have all the other costs associated with you know, maintaining you know, uh, oil and all that other stuff. So your cost overall, even with low gasoline prices, if you think your overall maintenance and cost of, 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 of fueling, much lower. Than, uh, than what's going on with gasoline. Margo, we haven't even talked about hydrogen and fuel cells. What do you think is going to happen uh, there? You watch this stuff. Can the world build yet another infrastructure, in this case, a hydrogen refueling infrastructure? Yeah. So, so for full disclosure, I, I serve on a committee to advise the energy secretary on fuel cells and hydrogen vehicles. So just, you know where I'm coming from. So there are a lot of arguments that we should not be th thinking at all about fuel cells and hydrogen vehicles. The only thing that we should be concentrating is electric vehicles. I'm not of that view. And the reason for that is I think we need to have choices in the marketplace and we need to have offerings that people are or countries may decide that's the way to go. And we see what's going on in Japan. I mean, they are very committed. For f on fuel cells, and there are benefits to fuel cells. Uh, you know, range is one of the benefits. F refueling is another benefit. The cost has come down significantly. California uh, is there is a big experiment going on in, with with California right now. But uh, and I was there a couple of weeks ago in a meeting uh, with the Californians and the committee. Uh, you, you, John, you really don't know how fuel cells and hydrogen vehicles will continue to evolve. You know, 15 years ago, it was a million dollars to buy a fuel cell car. Uh, today, I think the Toyota's what, in the 60s, 65? Yeah, 60,000 60, plus. Well, I'm right? not sure that's what it really costs, but. What, the, yeah, yeah, but, but, but the biggest right. issue in my mind is, the, uh, the, the biggest issue is, is, is uh, infrastructure. Uh, and that's where electric cars have a big advantage, because I, I plug it in my house, I go to, uh, the train station, there is a plug, actually I get priority, you know, yeah. because I have a, an electric car or airports. So uh, the biggest challenge will be 
how are we going to get the infrastructure in the marketplace, and who's going to pay for it? Well, that? that's, so that's the question I was going to ask you, because every time I hear someone from the industry talk about hydrogen fuel yeah. cells, it, it can almost set a stopwatch. Yeah. Yeah. At some yeah. point, someone's going to say, well, you know, yeah. uh, we need some help with that infrastructure, yeah. and it's this. Who's going to pay for it? Yeah. And, it's, and, and I, again, I wonder yeah. how, much, yeah. how much public it, funding sh is, 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 is right for that enterprise. Yeah. And, and we're getting down to the and end. I need a quick answer. And who's answer. doing it? And who's going to put the funding? Would the oil to come forward, like Shell. I don't know. Shell Shell's is very the, interested is, is in very in interested. The only company. Um, maybe that's another way for them to continue to be relevant. Could I quickly, yeah, real quick, quickly, quickly ask, uh, flip this over and talk about diesels a little bit. What do you mm -hmm. think is going to happen with Volkswagen and with diesels in the United States? 30 seconds, Margo. <laughs> Diesel can be clean. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, VW cheated. Uh, and they cheated not, not only the customers, but they cheated everybody. And Do you think they should buy all those cars back? If they cannot fix it, if they cannot fix it, where people that bought the cars, they bought them for performance, they bought them for fuel efficiency, and for being clean, if they cannot fix to give the customers what they were looking for when they bought the car, and the environment. Uh, yeah. then they should buy it. They should buy them back. back. I, I hate to cut this off. This is a great conversation. Margo Olge, thanks so much for coming on Thank the show you, today. Thank you, Joe White, Todd Lassa, great having you guys too. And I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Underwriting for Autoline this week has been provided by Borg Warner.